got torque equals I alpha. In fact, is that even like the big screen? Yep, there we go. So in here we put and we had derived what I was. squared for a particle that was going around and if we had multiple particles we could just add up the individual rotational inertias for it well the thing is we're not going to use calculus but by using calculus you can actually do this for a shape where you have an it did you do integration yet no no Second semester. I think it's coming up. Okay. Well, you know that integration is when you're finding the area under your curve. So what they're doing is they're taking the shape and finding the area for the shape. Just giving you, if you do it in more than one dimension, you get volume. Um, so if we take something really simple, like a hoop. And we say that that hoop is actually a set of infinite number of particles that all form the ring or the hoop. So then we know that to find the rotational inertia, as I said, we just find the rotational inertia of each piece and add them together. And then in calculus, what we say is, okay, if we make these things infinitely smaller this sigma is going to turn into an integral symbol. And in this case, with the ring, we can see it without doing a whole lot of calculus. If all of my masses are the same and all of my radii are, radii are the same, I just equals mr squared for that whole hoop because, like I said, it's an infinite number of particles all at the same radius. That working for you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, Alan. Where, where did he go? Uh, I think like Nova Southeastern. Florida. In Florida. In Florida. Florida. Okay. So with that in mind, you can actually do this for a whole bunch of shapes. So for the cylindrical Hooper cylinder, I turns out to be just mr squared. So as I said, using calculus, and we're not going to use calculus, that's where they get all of these formulas from. So as long as you have something that's rotating around its center, so all of these are rotating, this is where your axis of rotation is in the center there. Um, if it's a solid cylinder or disc, turns out to be one, the, the one half, once again, comes from the calculus. If you have a solid sphere, it comes out to be two-fifths mr squared. If you have a hollow sphere, two-thirds mr squared. Um, all of these are not only in your book in the lesson. If you have your physical textbook, they're in the, on the last page. shapes. Instead of a thin ring or hoop, you could have a thick ring or hoop. So notice that for a thick ring, it is a noticeable thickness. We get one half times m times the sum of the squares of the two radius, radii. You could also have a disc. Now, this one ends up throwing people a lot. This disc is rotating about its center. So this would be like, even if like a merry-go-round platform or something is just spinning or a record. <coughs> CD, you know what CDs are? Mm -hmm. Okay, something like that. Whereas this is a disc that's flipping end over end. So that would be like if you flipped a coin in the air, it goes end over end. 
I say that because <laughs> I've had students do a problem where they were on a merry-go-round, or the problem dealt with a merry-go-round, and they used this, and I told them that I would not want to be on a merry-go-round that is rotating like that. Then we have a thin rod, and there are two possible situations for the thin rod that they give you. One is if it is rotating right through its center, it turns out, and this is the only one that's not using a radius, it's using a length, it is 1 12th ml squared. If you have it rotating about one end, it's 1 3rd ml squared. So really, all we're doing is we're replacing individual particles that are rotating with the shape that is rotating. And it's going to be rotating around its own, around some axis, usually going through. This right here is the axis for all of these. So this one's rotating that way, that way, and so on. Bill. No, just Big Bill. Big Bill. Yeah. But well, there's two in my class, so he just says Big Bill, and then we both look and he says, no, no, that one. We got one. Okay. You're both Big Bill? Yeah, there's two. There's two Big Bill. Right. And, and who is he? That's uh, William Bill Ross. Ross. That's Big Bill Ross. That's Big no, Bill no, no, Ross. No. Who is he who is saying Big uh, Bill? Oh, Hank. Mr. Hank. That's Bill Ross. And uh, <laughs> Mr. U called me Loud Bill instead. He didn't want to do the same thing Haney did, but he didn't want to just call me William. As I said, this is going to be a lot like problems that you did when you first did rotational inertia. We have a torque of 200 meter newtons applied to the solid cylinder, so it's rotating around the axis going right through its center. The mass of the cylinder is 20 kilograms and its radius is 2 meters. The mass is evenly distributed, which is important because if one side has more mass than the other, it's not going to, the, the inertia is not going to be the same. We want to find the angular acceleration produced by the torque.
going to use torque equals I alpha, where I, in this case, is going to be, <clears throat> when they get to the shapes, they stop calling it rotational inertia and call it moment of inertia, just like they call torques moments. So we go to our chart and a solid cylinder is one half m bar squared. Let me just put that in. Basically, your difference is that instead of using MR squared and a bunch of different particles, you now have a specific formula based upon the shape that's rotating. That's it. You have like a half an hour, so if you need to finish working on the lab, work on problem sets, 